very, very happy, very happy to offer this first open air and online discussion and wine tasting event this afternoon. Welcome to everybody who is joining us now. We look forward to sharing this next 90 minutes with you in what promises to be a very exciting discussion. We welcome you from the heart of the winelands in Stellenbosch in South Africa, where two of our USB alumni will present to us today in this beautiful setting on the screen. And the conversationalist for the afternoon with them will be our director, Professor Mark Smith at University Stellenbosch Business School. So our title for this event is the Vintage 2041, which is quite a look into the future, the future of the South African wine industry. This thought leadership webinar and virtual wine tasting is happening with Dr. Ido Haynes from Advini and Christy Hane from Arnim from Warwick and facilitated in conversation by our director, Professor Mark Smith. Welcome to everyone who is still joining us. We just give you a minute or two to get online, get settled and sit back, relax and enjoy this session. The Alumni Association is proud to offer a series of thought leadership webinars involving any of our 15 chapters of our alumni. You're welcome to suggest any topics to us during the event in the comment box, things that we need to look out for in the future, things that you would like us to share um, with you in future events or masterclasses. Lizelle Kahnemeyer um, from the alumni office is also on this call. Um, and we will be looking at your comments throughout. This is the venue where we welcome you this afternoon. Shortly, we'll hand over to our presenters and facilitator, but we wish we were, would, would have been able to all be here at this beautiful, beautiful venue in Stellenbosch. Just a quick guidelines, please engage throughout the session with us in the chat box. Um, we will be watching the chat box for your comments, questions, suggestions, anything you would like to share. And there will also be, of course, time for an open mic that you can engage with us. We love that. When the presenters are on the floor, please mute your microphones, but continue to make yourself visible. We love to see you as well all the time. Um, a quick look at the program before I introduce the um, facilitator for this afternoon. Um, the topic, of course, Vintage 2041, the future of the South African wine industry. And we will be led by our panel to when to taste our wine. For those of us that ordered wine and received their wine, um, we are looking forward to this session as well, to really have an immersive experience of the future of um, wine, the wine industry in South Africa and the links to Europe. Um, after that, we'll have closing remarks by about 20 past six and a thank you note. And we promise to finish on time um, by half past six South African time. Welcome to all the participants who's just joined us. We see some familiar faces. Thank you very much for sharing your precious time with us this afternoon. We hope you enjoy this session very much. And may I then introduce our conversationalist for the afternoon and who will facilitate the session, our director at the University of Stellenbosch Business School, Professor Mark Smith. Um, Professor Smith was previously faculty dean at Grenoble Ecole de Management in France. He is still in France and we expect him very soon in South Africa. We look forward to that. He was professor of human resource management where he was also director of the doctoral school and head of department and research team leader. Prior to working in France, he worked at Manchester Business School in the UK. 
His research interests focus on careers, gender, labor market policy and outcomes, working conditions, working time and work life integration. It is really with a huge privilege to present to you Professor Mark Smith, who will be um, introducing you to the panel leaders. Thank you very much. A warm welcome to everybody who's joined us in the meantime, and we hope you will enjoy the session very much. I thank you also to our Stellenbosch University colleague, Henk Utz, who's assisting there with all the very important audiovisual. Thank you, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Christelle. Um, I'm very proud to be here to represent the business school, Stellen University of Stellenbosch Business School, and to, to help facilitate this, uh, this session. As a British man who uh, lives in France and on his way to South Africa, you might think I'm on a kind of world tour of fine wines. Uh, and uh, since we, had, we don't really have fine wines in Britain, I think uh, I'm, I'm uh, heading in the right direction, let's say. But uh, and also one thing we have in is, well, France has very many fine wines, but we don't have, there's not a great deal of openness towards wines from elsewhere in the world. So I hope, uh, I was lucky enough to receive my wines by post this afternoon. So I, I do hope you've received yours, uh, yours too. I should, perhaps shouldn't tell my neighbours I'm drinking South African wine because uh, really, really you cannot buy wine that's not French. Uh, it's really, very, very, really quite hard in, to, do, to do in France. Uh, but I'm very much looking forward to, to tasting wine with, uh, with, with Ido and Christian. And uh, we're both MBA graduates from the, uh, for, from the, from the business school. And, uh, and I think it's really nice that we have uh, leading alumni leading, uh, helping us uh, put on an expert panel event like this. So Ido Hines is, uh, is the strategic, strategic development director from Advini, uh, from, from, who, who's helped organize the wine, the wine for us today. He's, uh, he's an expert in, in, in fine wines. He's also, as I said, and, and an author in terms of the working for the Wineland magazine. But as I said, he's also a, an accomplished uh, scholar through the business school, having done a MBA with us, but also a PhD as well, working on fam, uh, the work that studies uh, the wine industry and family family businesses in, 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 in the sector. We're also joined by Christian von Armen. Hope you've got a picture. There we go. He's from Warwick Wine Estates, the CEO of Warwick Wine Estates, and also a cum laude MBA from, from the business school. So we, we, we pick our experts very finely for you, the company, the wine. Uh, and, and he's also, uh, but also coming from Europe, but, uh, but now, now, in, now in South Africa, coming from the, from the Rhine Valley. Uh, another, another country, Germany, that doesn't always, uh, this, this keeps its good wine for itself, I find. And, uh, and if, you ever, if, you're, uh, if you're there, you should, uh, you should really try the wines there because they're really very fine. But bringing her expertise to to South Africa and to Warwick uh, in in terms of developing the, the 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 wine industry in in South Africa. One thing, just I just want to say a few words about the business school and the wine sector. So one one thing I wanted to underline is, as many of you, it's a common theme that we come we come back to is how business school has an impact. What's the point of a business school? Business schools have sometimes been faced by with sort of significant criticism. How did you manage to produce the graduates that creates the financial crash? How do you manage to produce graduates with dealing in unethical, unethical behaviors, etc.? But also, what's the what's the what's the relevance of business schools? And one thing that we're committed to at the University of Bosch Business School is being engaged with our local ecosystem and having an impact. Whether that's having an impact through creating responsible leaders, having an impact through creating entrepreneurship, or having an impact through the particularities of the of the local ecosystem, and obviously, coming for, being based in the Western Cape and in Stellenbosch, wine is a key part of that. Key, it's a key industry for South Africa. It's a key industry for the for Western Cape and the Stellenbosch area. One thing that surprised me in coming to South Africa uh, was how perhaps we hadn't really made enough of that connection between us as a business school and the, the wine industry and the wine sector in our, in our ecosystem and, in, and who are among our neighbors. And it's not exploited as much as, as we might see in, uh, among my French schools, that I, the French schools I've been working with uh, in, before joining Stellenbosch. So you see among other business schools that are firmly located in wine producing areas, you see the business schools really working much very closely with the wine industry in terms of developing programs, developing specializations, doing research, doing consultancy, uh, 
assist in the assist in the local sector in having having an impact. And that goes for the the wine industry to the north of where I am now. So I'm in the Rhone Valley. I'm talking to you from today. So to the north of me in Bourgogne, uh, there's uh, the there's the, the 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 wines. The business school there has very strong links with the with the wine industry, but also to the south in Montpellier, you see the the the, the Montpellier business schools were working with the Languedoc, another another area of of, of of fine wines. So I'm very excited that about that we can promote stronger links between us at the University of Stellenbosch Business School and the and the wine sector, and I think and go beyond the technical links that, that exist already between the Stellenbosch University and and the and the wine sector in in the Western Cape, and go to more towards thinking about business strategy, succession, marketing, et cetera, that really allow us to, uh, to share our expertise and also to build a stronger links between us, us, and, us and the wine sector. We've already been doing a little bit of that. So I said that, that Edo's uh, PhD, for example, is based in that area. One of my recent professors who was promoted to full professor, her inaugural lecture, which you can see on the internet, uh, is actually about the marketing and consumer behavior in the wine industry. Really important to understand how people choose wines how people select uh, select different uh, different brands, different types of wines, etc. But we also have academics working in strategy, and also many MBA students who are coming from that sector. So what we hope to do in the coming years is build our links much more strongly with uh, with the wine sector in 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 and around Stellenbosch through education, through it, through our work with uh, with research, but also. It's also a social impact as well in terms of open, in terms of the, the consequences and impact that we can have on, on the wider, wider community. So I'm really proud to welcome you here today. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all very thirsty and, and, and wondering which of the many bottles we, you should be opening and, uh, and, and in what order and also in looking forward to hearing the, the expert opinions of, of Edo and Christian. So I'm very, very, very pleased to pass over to them when they're going to guide us through which wines we're going to drink, which ones to open the first. And, uh, Look forward to hearing what they have to say. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Lavenir Estate. Lavenir means the future in French. And um, I think it's quite fitting to do a discussion about the future of the wine industry at a winery that was, which name refers to the future. And um, when we spoke about the theme of the tasting, um, a time frame in the South African wine industry is quite an interesting concept because if you look at the broader industry, um, it's older than 360 years. But if you look at the post democratic wine industry, it's barely 30 years old. And um, we took 20 years, um, maybe vintage 2041, um, which I feel is, a, is, in terms of wine industry, a, a nice time frame in terms of being a medium term change. Um, the wine industry is interesting in the sense that it is traditional, but it is also very dynamic. And um, in a way, this whole discussion will often lead to some paradoxes. Um, when Christiana and I spoke earlier, we discussed the fact that the wine industry is getting more globalized, um, noting that I work for a French company um, that invested in South Africa and Christiane works for an American owned company. But on the other hand, it is also going closer to home in terms of um, the importance of homegrown crafted wines from single vineyards that also have a story to tell. So um, it's an ind industry, it's a multifaceted industry. And um, if we look at the time frame for today, it's almost difficult to think that we'll be able to cover many of these topics within, in an hour and a half, um, because you can look at marketing, you can look at industry structure. You can look at investment, you can look at viticulture, um, you can look at innovation and technology in terms of production, as well as in terms of sales. So as a starting point, I looked at the statistics in terms of the wine industry 20 years ago, um, and then we can discuss where it might go in the next 20 years. So in 2001, the South African wine industry was bigger in terms of um, planted hectares across the country or across the Western Cape. Um, the production and volume was bigger, but the average bottle exported or even sold locally um, was, was um, a lot less expensive than it is today. 
Um, there were, were also many more producers in terms of viticulture. It's becoming a smaller industry, both in terms of number of players as well as um, vineyards planted to vines. And I think a lot of this discussion will also again then lead to um, premiumization, how we get a higher price for our wines in the international markets. And I think for the broader South African wine industry, that is a medium term goal for us to achieve. Um, and I, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm the head of strategic de um, development for Advini South Africa. And I work for the wineries Lavinia, Lebona, Ken Forrester and Stellenbosch Vineyards, which are all based in Stellenbosch. And on that note, I'd just like to welcome and thank my fellow panelists, Christiana van Arnhem, the CEO of Warwick, just up the road from here. Exactly. Thank you, Ida. Much appreciated for the introduction. And um, yeah, hello to everybody on the other side of the screen, fellow alumni. I'm very pleased that you're joining us this evening. It's wonderful to share this discussion and some of these wines with you. Um, I would hope that most of you have some wine in your glass already. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share with you what I've got in my glass and also connect to some of the dots that Ida was talking about. Um, I've got the First Lady uh, Rosé in my glass, which is made from Pinotage. And I think to some extent that goes back to the, the, the point or the hinting at a possible topic for the discussion that Ido made that a lot of, although a lot of globalization is taking place, there's still a very strong element towards going back to discovering what's actually grown and produced in your own backyard. And hence we chose Pinotage for this uh, rosé. It's a variety that's obviously South Africa's very own variety that I believe in the future um, will be a much stronger um, flag Bearer. I'm not sure if that's the right word for South Africa and the South African wine industry in, in the global scenario. Um, so it's a very light and elegant wine. It's perfect for a beautiful spring afternoon and evening that we have here, as you can see. Um, it's only got 11.5% alcohol, um, very easy to drink. Um, also speaks to maybe some of the trends that we've been seeing. People favoring wines with a slightly lower alcohol more than uh, those big bold heavy wines and also the beautiful color and uh, the, the, it's a dry wine it's only got 2.4 grams of sugar overall so it's almost yeah it's a, I don't want to say healthy that could be misconstrued but <laughs> it's a wine that speaks to a lot of elements of what I think the future of wine will hold yeah so it should be so cheers and welcome. There we go. <laughs> cheers. Um, I can only echo what Christiana has mentioned about Vinotage. Um, at Lavanya in particular, we often use the, 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 the phrase authenticity is the new luxury. And I think at one point it was important to have a very fancy label that has embossing and that has gold foil on it. That's often a very heavy bottle that looks luxurious. Well, a lot of it has changed towards a wine that has to tell a story and have authenticity. And um, I don't know if this is a fact or if it's just something that people in the wine industry like to say, but apparently the two industries with the most stock keeping units or products, um, the two industries are the music industry and the wine industry. Because every year, every winery brings out a new product mm -hmm. and there are many of them. And with such a heavily crowded space, you have to be known for something. And that's why I particularly would like to focus in terms of the wine tasting. And by the way, we're not going to have a formal wine tasting where we pour wine number one and share the tasting notes and the way that it was made and say which kind of barrel it went into. Um, we're just going to try to fit in the different wines within the discussion. Um, but with that, um, and in a way, it was also emphasized by the French owners of Lavenir. If you're based in Stellenbosch, like Lavenir, what are you known for? Um, the most planted varietal is Chenin Blanc in South Africa, and our very own red wine varietal is Pinotage. So Lavenir has always been known for these varietals, but 
more recently, we've focused even more on these two varietals. So that within a very crowded space, you're known for something instead of trying to be a, a jack of all trades. And um, that element of focus is particularly important, especially in Stellenbosch. And we've seen across many estates how the list of wine offerings have become smaller, more focused and better. And um, I think in particular, that is going to be a trend that we'll, we'll see in wine styles going forward. Um, just in terms of the rosé that we have, um, 10 years ago, perhaps even eight years ago, the general rosé was, what can I call it? Um, rave pink, neon pink. <laughs> and I think this lighter color also hints towards the globalization that's going on in the wine industry. It's this is more typically sure. the Provence style, the lighter style, and some of the other wines from Tavel. And within the wine industry in South Africa, we have more travel winemakers. They've been exposed to more wine styles. And there, again, we spoke about paradoxes. On the one hand, you're being influenced by what you see abroad. But on the other hand, you need to be authentic in terms of your offering. And I think this is why this pinotage with this lighter style is a brilliant example of where we've benefited from exposure to the global wine industry, but we're doing it in a very authentic way by producing it from our very own grape varietal pinotage. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more on that point. That I think global benchmarking is certainly something that takes place all the time with our winemaking team and also as, as consumers, I think. People are being more and more exposed to international references and uh, yeah, to, to take all those considerations and impressions and inspirations into account and then distilling them back into what can be achieved within our local context. I think that is really something that is quite exciting from a South African wine industry point of view. And um, also, I just want to go back to what you were saying about specialization at Warwick. We've also done the same thing, as you said, identified what is really typical, what, what is Stellenbosch known for, in which context do we play, and Pinotage is definitely part of that. We've had some very beautiful old vines of, of uh, Pinotage. We acquired uh, another property just on the other side of the road uh, called 8 Cake, which is a huge, uh, long history of excellent winemaking and growing of Pinotage. And on that farm, we also discovered a block of old vine Shannon, and that also speaks to the heritage. And we produced for the first time this year a Shannon Blanc, although that's not necessarily part of what, what Warwick used to be known for, which is more the Bordeaux style varieties. We still play a pay tribute to this uh, beautiful local variety and also the old vine concept, which in my view, just doesn't, it makes wines of distinction. It just gives them gravitas and much more of a story to tell. And, it, and then it comes back to storytelling. And for me, this is all about what were people doing in 1978? Somebody planted that vineyard. How many people were involved there? How many years that vineyard has been pruned, looked after by so many people and families and generations of, of um, People. It's for me that's where the local stories come in, and that often for me personally resonate a lot. And when we present those wines to our guests, to our customers, there's a lot of that which people really get interested in, into the specific vineyard. Where does this wine, this grape, come from? And there's so much to tell, and um, yeah, storytelling, okay. that concept. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'd like to just sort of link onto what you mentioned in terms of benchmarking as well as again the influence of international wines that we now have access to and being able to travel and winemakers that have in many cases um, produced wines across different continents and then bringing all of that knowledge back home i think um let's let me start by saying this industry stands on the shoulders of giants um again as mentioned post-democracy, the wine industry is barely three decades old, but within this time, there has been a lot that happened, and there have been some legends that set the scene for the, 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 the time that we're in now. And I think the wine industry has, in many ways, reached a maturity where when you produce a 
Bordeaux-style blend or a Cabernet, or particularly a Chenin Blanc from South Africa, from Stellenbosch, let's say Stellenbosch. Um, benchmarking isn't necessarily trying to be like a Chenin Blanc from the Loire Valley, which is the home of Chenin Blanc. It is taking the influences of what you've tasted from the Loire Valley and embracing that, but reflecting what you have here in Stellenbosch. That 8 cake vineyard is a, is a wonderful example of that. And um, also in terms of reflecting what you are, there, there is less of a pressure on South Africa to be like other wine industries. We're comfortable in our own skins and we can now present something that is, um, and I think it's, it's come away, but now at this point, it's, it's being emphasized more than ever before to produce the be best at what you are producing instead of trying to be like a Bordeaux or a Loire style. Mm. And in terms of benchmarking, I think at one stage when you looked at the international benchmark, let's look at Rosé, there was a stage where you would say, okay, this is the South African wine, in the wine category, I'm at that price point, I, my competitors are these. While we're also at a point now where we can say, this is the global Rosé wine category, this is where we fit in, this is how I can complement the South African um, the South African offer. And in that way, I think, having been exposed to some other international wine industries, I think South African winemakers and the wine industry per se shares a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a strength of the industry. We don't hold our cards against our chest in terms of marketing or production or, vin or vineyards or anything within the value chain. We share a lot and that should be seen as a very strong um, element of the way that we operate. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think that's one of the things that I enjoy most about working in the wine industry. It's the openness and the friendship that one has, although technically we are competitors. Um, we are also friends in the community, and I think all of us together work together to put South Africa onto the global map. And uh, in terms of research and um, technological inspiration that comes from overseas, it's not just about mm -hmm. benchmarking wines. It's also about benchmarking and experiencing new technologies that have been developed. And I think that's where universities, for instance, also will play a great role in, in the future. And I think it's a wonderful um, decision to, to bring the University of Stellenbosch closer to the wine industry because there's so much potential collaboration. And um, yeah, I, I keep using the word inspiration, but I think that's what it is. We're different departments, different industries, different um, What's the word I'm looking for? Ways of thinking come together and actually have the opportunity to bring South Africa forward also in terms of technological leadership when it comes to, to the wine industry, vineyard practices, um, and so on and so forth, specifically because we are also from an environmental perspective exposed to some of the early stages of climate change that will possibly impact us earlier than other areas. So we should be on the forefront of developing new techniques, new um, ways of working in the vineyard, for example, that mm. are more sparing with our resources and that address things like climate change. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I've got a question here from Christelle, which wine should the people be opening? <laughs> and it's Rosé, it's the first wine that we've had, um, but I think we discussed Shannon quite a bit, yes. and let's move on to... <clears throat> oh, Edo, just, Edo, just before you move on to the next wine, could I just ask, it with, as, we, as a consumer in France, you, we see more, a greater range of Rosés, and sort of more quality rosés as well. So there's, is, is it, would you say in, in globally, the wine, the rosé sector, the rosé type of wine is moving to a more nuanced and sort of quality uh, quality end the, rather than that, that uh, fluor, fluoro pink or, uh, or rave pink that you described at the start. People will consume <laughs> rosé at different times of the year uh, rather than it being something to just have in the, on, when you're with a, when you're in, in the sunshine on a, on a sunny summer day sort of thing is it or is it becoming more of a quality product and then the second thing which is very more specific to tasting what's your opinion on putting ice cubes in rosé because i find french people do that and i find that kind of strange all right yeah um, I, let me answer on the wine ice cubes i personally don't mind i think um 
that's what works for you by all means. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so rosé is one of the wine categories in the world that is growing very quickly and it is expanding in terms of it's expanding in terms of who's drinking rosé um, it's not limited to a certain demographic anymore but on the other hand it is also in many cases especially in south africa one of the first ones that new wine drinkers start drinking and with that the wine the rosé category for me is extremely important and um, without completely putting on my marketing hat, if I can take the Lavenier example of Rosé, um, we were the first winery in South Africa to really produce a premium Rosé that at the time that it was launched, that was in 2015, um, cost 170 Rand, which was significantly higher than any other Rosé in South Africa. And that was after the winemaker did a harvest in Provence and tasted those wines and he came back it's fine and he also produced that from from pinotage and while a while ago rosé was you know a category that more or less tasted the same now it's a very dynamic category as well you have wines that have um, a bit of a touch of wood like the Glen rosé you have you still have darker styles in terms of being the wine that many people start with often rosé in south africa is still sweet and um, when you use the word sweet rosé, there's often a lot of judgment um, or perceived judgment in the wine industry. And this is where I link onto the comments of ice. I also absolutely don't have an issue if someone drinks their wine with ice. Um, often it is the way that people start drinking wine. And if people start drinking wine, it is positive for the wine industry. We're exposing them to wine and they need to be comfortable. I think snobbery in the wine industry is um, something that is an issue, especially in a country where um, the population that drinks wine is a very small part of the population. And the first step is to get people to drink wine and to bring in snobbery in terms of not putting ice in your wine or only drinking dry wines. Um, would be a huge mistake. I agree. And just to add to what you were saying, you said it, but I think it's important to mention it explicitly. I think when it comes to rosé, there's a big difference between rosé as a byproduct as opposed mm. to rosé being made with intent. And I think that's where what you said comes in. Actually, having something in mind and creating that as opposed to having some leftover red wine or something like that that you can't that you don't have a home for and then i don't know making a rosé from from that uh there's a huge difference between that so with our, our rosé we, we grow a vineyard or grow vineyards specifically to produce that wine it's not a byproduct and the more we see that going in the future the more quality there will be and that's not that's not rosé specific that's with anything making wine with intent and a specific outcome in mind, as opposed to leaving things to the accidents of nature, I think is, is going to be a huge step forward. And that's where also, again, science comes in. The more there's still so many elements of winemaking that are still not really understood properly, that even to a qualified winemaker are still a little bit of a mystery. And, and that's where research comes in and understanding everything that has to do with wine much better and being able to work with that and then apply those this knowledge to um, make better wines, make better products. Mm. Um, linking on to collaboration and research, I think, and Christiana mentioned it earlier, old vine Shannon is probably one of the most important treasures that South Africa has. And it's a, it's a real Cinderella story. Many of these old vine Shannon plantings were planted to produce either Larger volume wines, and um, South Africa's first global brand was Liebestein. That was Shannon based, but a lot, of, a lot of it was also planted to produce brandy. And many of these wines that were essentially planted to produce higher yields are now producing some of the finest wines in South Africa. And um, in terms of research, there's a vineyard behind us there. It's um, Lavinia's single block Shannon. And um, the old 
um, Vine project led by Rosa Creo is a project where they certify a vineyard as being a certified heritage vineyard. Um, it has to have a certain age, and with that, you can apply certification to the bottle. And to me, it's a, it's a nice full circle. Um, academics from Montpellier came to Stellenbosch and to South Africa to isolate clone material from some of the older Chenin Blanc vineyards in Stellenbosch so that they can see whether these vineyards have genetically modified so that they can isolate these clones and essentially produce new clones commercially um, that have been changed because of their time in South Africa and different circumstances. And knowing that our Chenin Blanc originally comes from that area, it's a nice way to see how the, even the viticultural um, research in terms of globally collaborating has sort of gone a full circle. On that note, should we have some Shannon? Yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. Yeah. So um, the wine in our glasses is called the Provenance Shannon. Um, provenance means home. And with that, it sort of reflects the fact that these are um, vineyards that are at our home at La Vineyard Estate. And again, that just links to the importance of having a story. Um, it's increasingly important to be able to say this vineyard comes from Stellenbosch. It is an estate grown wine from that type of soil, especially when you're looking at a more premium product. And in terms of winemaking styles on a global level, and I'm going to be a bit technical and wine geeky here, but producing wine in the Loire Valley is, on a technical level, very, very different to producing wines in Stellenbosch. In the Loire Valley, where rot is a huge problem, you sort of hope to reach the sugar levels where you can produce a wine that is a dry wine, that is balanced, and all of that. If they get rot at an earlier stage, they have to produce other wine styles, which is bubbly. And I don't want to go too deeply into the technical side of it, but in Stellenbosch, it's quite the opposite. Um, our grapes will most definitely ripen. And in our case, it is a case of trying to find that balance of picking the grapes at the right stage before, before they actually become too ripe. And I think winemakers have embraced the richness of, of the natural richness that we have, um, but also bringing in the natural acidity by picking them at, them at, the, right, at the right ripeness. And I think in terms of wine compared to other alcoholic beverages or beverages per se it's a product that is mostly enjoyed while you're eating food and i think as an industry we've also sort of embraced our local cuisine trying to sort of do pairings with our local cuisine on the local level as well and being proud of what we do and what comes from south africa um, and i've i've been involved in anything from um that's Babylon and in, in Engels. Um, abalone. Abalone. Abalone tastings, because South African abalone, and this is farmed legal abalone, is something that we're quite known for in Asia. So why not embrace that and link it to a wine, and especially at a premium level, making use of that fact. And um, in terms of both the, 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 the Pinotage and the Chenin Blanc that we focus on here at Lavinier, they go extremely well with our Cape Malay curries. And for an international group to taste these wines with the local cuisine, it's special, again, at least to the story. We have a wonderful lady that works at Lavinia's Country Lodge, Tani Mini, that makes the most beautiful babuti. And we're proudly serving Tante Mini's babuti with our Shannon style. And with that, people come to Lavinia, they return home with the story, with a person, with that authenticity and with that fingerprint. I love that. <laughs> okay. So um, apparently the, the, the light, the sun is setting behind us. So we're going to disappear for a couple of seconds and change the lighting on the side. <laughs> Are there any questions? Any questions? Maybe I'll, I'll well, while you're moving, I could ask a question. Uh, would you, yes. you mention Baberti there as a to go with the? Are you you're back now? Oh, yeah, we can see you much better now. Mm. We <laughs> do. You, with what would, food would you recommend with the Chenin uh, compared to say the the rosé? 
Would you like to comment? Yeah. On that um, okay. My my favorite and and it was an accidentally accidental discovery actually, um, which was subsequently picked up not not through my inspiration, but I just realized that that was the case. Uh, the Shannon Long Association here in South Africa actually picked up on that same theme. It's, it's sushi. For me, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, pairing with Shannon, the sushi, and particularly because of the ginger, the pickled ginger that is often served with sushi. Mm. That was, for me, such a surprise. And it was really, I, was, I had ordered some sushi, um, and I had some of our old wine Shannon left over standing there. And just because it was the next best thing, I, I poured myself a glass and I could not believe it. It was such a wonderful um, pairing. So that is my favorite uh, pairing for sushi, uh, for, for Shannon, but also curries. I love curries. So that's always a good one. Um, I don't know. Those are my favorites. What about you? I think what makes Shannon Blanc special especially Chenin Blanc from Stanovash, is the texture of the wine. Um, it is a wine that is not necessarily as outspoken in terms of flavor as something like a Sauvignon Blanc, but in terms of texture, it is just so multifaceted again. And you can enjoy a Chenin which has sort of the generosity of the fruit combined with that texture with something like a curry because it will stand up to the spiciness. And um, when I say spiciness, it's across the board. It's everything from the ginger that you enjoy with your sushi to something like a mild curry um, or even a more spicier curry. And um, for me, that, that also links to the versatility of the grape in its essence. It's not only versatile in terms of the style of wine that you can produce from it and even where you can produce it. It's also versatile in terms of the type of food that you can enjoy with. I agree. There's a, there's a question, um, and I'll read it out so loud. I noticed on the website of Abini that you're committed to sustainable development. Please share your thoughts on how to create a low environmental footprint. And um, Lavanier is in the process of converting to organic wine production. And I think in that sense, South Africa as a wine producing nation is um, falling a bit behind in terms of the percentage of our wine that is produced organically. And there are reasons for that. It's not necessarily the easiest conversion to do. There are also financial pressures and the likes. And there's a risk associated to that. But I, I think in terms of the wine industry 2041, a much larger, larger percentage of our vineyards will have been um, converted to organic production. Um, and then well, we spoke about it before this discussion. And this is an interesting paradox. We work in a more globalized industry, um, but the pressure in terms of your carbon footprint is increasingly important. So while there are influences globally and ownership globally, um, I can only anticipate that within a couple of years, there will be um, not necessarily penalties, but levies and that kind of thing in terms of exporting wines based on the carbon footprint um, in terms of transporting your wine to a destination market. And um, on that note, it is incredibly important that we develop the market on our doorstep. I mentioned earlier that in, in South Africa, a very small percentage of our population drinks wine. And that is an opportunity and a challenge for us, but the same applies to the African continent. And um, it's not only in terms of production, it's in terms of the entire value chain, in terms of producing packaging that is recyclable, that is lighter, and um, having a more sustainable, broader perspective of the wine industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think if I also talk about Warwick and organic, uh, it's definitely the way we are heading. Um, at the moment, due to the risks that you mentioned, we are not quite there yet. We've done a lot of replanting. So we've got a lot of very young vines who are at huge risk. If there is um, something that creeps up in the vineyard that we don't want there, it's, it's something that we can't just allow and um, treat organically. The risks are just too high. But as we move into a more sustainable vineyard replanting program, um, we will definitely embrace more of the principles of organic wine growing. In terms of uh, carbon footprint, some of the obvious um, changes that we have made is in terms of our glass packaging. We um, have reduced 
we changed some of our premium wines where initially I think you mentioned these big bold heavy bottles we've moved some of them into lighter weight uh, glass bottles which has been received very well on a um, sales trip that I made recently to Europe a lot of people have asked about that and have commented on it without me actually pointing it out but just saying look I realized you moved from this heavy weight bottle into something lighter why is that and I explained it that's it is because of carbon footprint and, and us wanting to reduce our impact on, on the environment in, in that regard. So those are some of the easier fixes that one can apply rapidly also when it comes to the selection of your uh, labeling material, the, the glue that is used, whether it's uh, biodegradable or not. So those are some decisions that can be implemented relatively quickly. Others do take a little bit more time like organic production, for instance, but that I think is not the be all and end all of sustainable production. One can also produce with uh, or grow grapes with minimal impact, doesn't necessarily have to be organic, but there are ways of minimizing the use of pesticides, herbicides, etc. And um, just to link back to Stellenbosch Business School, um, it's interesting, I used Christiana's MBA thesis as a template to do mine on it because both were wine related, both were surveys, we just investigated different aspects of it. Um, and the topic that I studied, and this was in 2012, was the acceptance of green wines being environmentally friendly. And um, back then, and it's, it's a while ago, um, essentially, the outcome of the study was that people don't necessarily want a certified organic or biodynamic um, wine because it's not necessarily, it wasn't necessarily understood at that time. Um, things like if you buy a bottle, a portion of the um, proceeds from that bottle is donated um, in terms of conserving nature or conserving vegetation. Um, things like recycled bottles, things like recycled packaging. Things were, that were sort of more understandable and closer to home were more important mm. to the South African market. And I think in many cases, it is still the point, um, the case. Um, but I also think that we've matured as a country in terms of the acceptance of organic, because if you buy organic bananas, one day you're going to buy organic wine as well, if they're more readily available. Um, but I think the concept of sustainable wine production, environmentally, friendly wine production is a broad one and shouldn't be narrowed to a certification. I agree with that mm. totally. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, just, uh, was there another question? Or? Yes, um, and I'd like to pose this one to you, Christina. How does South African or Stellenbosch wines compete in the UK Euro wine markets against Australian and Chilean, and those are new world, and the question then says French and Spanish wines, which are old world wines. So, broad question, but go for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, what do they compete? Um, so, I was, I spent quite a bit of time in, in Europe lately so i'm not going to talk too much about the uk market now because i haven't been there lately i haven't actually i must admit that i haven't really um stayed on track with exactly what's happening there in the in the very commercial sector on, on warwick side we operate very much in the premium um category there in the uk so we don't really compete as such with that intense competition in the uk retail sector so i think that's a good space to be um, in, in Europe, especially Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium, where I was now, um, South Africa is struggling a little bit, but not against the Australians and the Chileans and the Argentinians necessarily, but again, but, but much more competition from the German producers, specifically in Germany. And that goes back to what you were saying earlier, people buying more from their own backyard. No, um, uh -huh. When I was there, um, the 
the big floods in the R Valley had just happened, which is one of the northern wine regions in Germany. A lot of cellars were destroyed. A lot of producers lost their entire production, their entire production facilities. And there was a huge amount of outpouring from the general population to buy those wines just like that overnight. Everybody suddenly bought up all the remaining stocks of wine from the R Valley because of the emotional and personal connection that those people felt. So it's things like that where I think people, the closer they are to a market, the more um, impacted they will be by what's going on in that market. So the, the poor harvest in France might impact French buying behavior or that of the Belgians and the Dutch who are quite close and, and strong supporters of those markets. So I think it's gonna come in waves and ebbs and flows. And as people then experience wines from within their vicinity and they support them and then possibly interest will shift again towards South African wines and wines from the global market. So it's a, it's a very broad and very complex question to ask but it seems to be very short-term, short-term trends and then long-term trends which relate back to sustainability and what we as a country and us as a region can tell about South Africa, South African wines that also resonate with people. It feels like it's all about resonance and and who do you want to support? Who do you want to give your money to? Who do you want to buy it from? Mm. So, yes. And at the moment, I feel South Africa has got a very good, got a good story to tell. Uh, but so do some of the European producers. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to just focus on what you mentioned earlier about not competing in the very competitive UK retail market. Mm. Um, in Stellenbosch in particular, I think we've reached a stage where we cannot sustainably produce wine at a certain price point, mm. and we need to sell the wine above that. And I mentioned earlier um, premiumization and being able to sell a wine at a higher price point is probably the greatest opportunity that the South African wine industry has. And if you look at foreign investments, we're on the R44 here. Um, if you look from the, at the R44 from Clippers towards Somerset West, there are international over, owners from across the world. And I think the opportunity there that they are seeing is the opportunity of value growth. Um, there was a study done earlier of, about um, wine competitions. And if you compare wines that have the same very high score in certain wine publications, I can't remember which wine publications these were, um, if you look at the same score of different regions and you compare that with the price, it was very, very affordable to buy a top-end South African wine compared to one from Australia, Spain, Argentina, France, even Italy and Spain. And I think that is our challenge and our opportunity at the moment in terms of embracing the story that, let's face it, South Africa has very interesting stories to tell per se. Embracing that, add value to the product, um, get the name out there. And this is an important point. Um, at the moment in the United States, when you're competing on a general wine shelf, there is a category for France, there is a category for Italy, there is a category for Spain and for Australia. Mm -hmm. But very often, South Africa finds itself in other regions. Yes, new world. New world and other <laughs> regions. And yeah. our challenge is to break out of that, get our own piece on the shelf, which isn't necessarily at the bottom shelf, mm. but at the mid-tier and the higher tier, because that is where we can produce wines that are environmentally sustainable, create more jobs, and um, be a sustainable industry. And in terms of job creation, one of the most important assets of the wine industry is its tourism facet. And I think that was very hard hit by COVID um, because many of the wine areas, not even included, um, have a very strong hospitality component to it. And um, suddenly that was shut down. And I'm, 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 we, 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 we're regularly engaging with government, but it is very important that we switch that back on because if you look at the South African context, job creation is incredibly important and it is important to this industry. And if we want an industry that is sustainable at many levels, the tourism part of it also needs to be strong. And um, 
we've had a bit of a dip with um, with COVID, but it's a very resilient industry, and I'm sure we'll bounce back. Yeah, I'd like to think that, and uh, I think tourism and wine tourism specifically is probably one of the elements where South Africa certainly has an edge over some of the potential competitors that were mentioned earlier. I think uh, I'm not sure if uh, France, French producers are as open to visitors as we are, mm -hmm. not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. I, Germans I, have certainly improved their mm -hmm. offering, yes. Um, if I can just quickly take the French um, option there, or the <laughs> French comparison. Um, being part of a French group, to me, one of the most inspiring things was to see how they come and see the hospitality offering that we have in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And going back inspired, applying what we do here, there, just like in many cases, we um, sort of learn from them in terms of winemaking, they come and see that there's a huge opportunity in terms of wine tourism and um, see what now they can embrace that on their side as well. That's and I'm sure wonderful. the same applies in Germany as well. Yeah, it looks yeah. like it. It looks like it. And, and yeah, tourism also Warwick, um, unfortunately, has been quite uh, empty <laughs> of visitors the last few months. But it is today was one of those beautiful days and people do come out and people do want to support and spend their money in their backyard, which is uh, wonderful to see. And weekends are always busy with the locals. So we just, uh, yeah, we look forward to having some of our international guests back. Uh, but I believe they're coming. So, yeah. and wonderful. And also, just making back to COVID again, being under pressure leads to innovation. And um, I don't know how many of the participants are in Europe at the moment and how many of you have ordered wine from Caprio like Mark has done. But if you look at the Caprio business model, they, um, they used to rely solely on when, well, not solely, but mostly on when people visit a tasting room in South Africa and they want to have wine delivered to their homes in Europe, they would fill in a form here and the wines are already in a warehouse in Germany and they get sent to their doorstep in Europe. Caprio has changed the way that they operate by um, presenting Zoom, Zoom tastings for South African wineries because they've got a huge database of existing clients. And I think if there's an area where the South African wine industry has also matured a lot um, during the past two years because of COVID, and, I'm, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm anticipating that at least in the medium term, it is a sales channel that is only going to grow. It is direct sales. It is being able to use a database and specifically target customers and speak to them, tell those stories and instead of relying on an importer or a supermarket or a website to sell your wine, um, doing it directly, mm -hmm. which also leads to higher margins, which is an extra benefit to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just want to add to the Caprio model. I actually went to see them when I was in Germany now uh, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and it was lovely to talk to them because it's easy for somebody like that to possibly lose enthusiasm for, for South Africa, for South African wine. But that's not the case at all. Like you said, they've changed their business model to some extent, and they really are able to um, capitalize on their um, uh, on their database, which is consisting of people who have been to South Africa, who have an affinity to it. And once you see it, you believe it and you love it. And, and that is really, it's, that's where the tourism part really comes in. Once people have been to the country, and to a vineyard, they can make a connection that nobody else can. And that creates a whole different loyalty. I almost feel the wine probably tastes different to somebody who's been at the farm and experienced the wine here than to somebody who just buys it off the shelf and, and she mm -hmm. just drinks it without any other associations to it. So that's why I love business models mm -hmm. like that. And I'm yeah, always excited to support uh, that kind of creativity. We've got a question from Wendy McCullough. This is that's for you, Christiana. Oh. Um, would you be willing to reflect on the transformation of the wine industry in relation to gender? It still seems like a very male-dominated industry, especially at the top. Yeah. It's a, it's a question I get asked very often. And... Um, 
for me personally, sometimes it's a little bit harder to, to reply to that because I don't primarily see myself as, as a woman in the wine business. That's the, the female element is not something that I um, characterize myself as the first thing that comes to mind. So I'm more a person who a person who works in the wine business. But because of the, the industry and also because of the brand that I'm associated with, which is Warwick, who was essentially put on the map by uh, Norma Ratcliffe, who was one of the first female winemakers in South Africa. There's obviously a legacy attached to it. Um, I, I feel privileged to be in the position that I'm in, um, being entrusted with uh, the responsibility for such a big company and such a big uh, enterprise and so many people. Um, and the fact that I'm a woman and I have a mostly male management team, it, it works for me. <laughs> but um, I don't think that's really answering the question. I think that there's a lot of opportunity, but sometimes I think maybe other ladies are not as inclined to take up the challenge. I'm fortunate and fortunate too. Um, yeah. I, I'm uh, personally quite confident in my abilities and I, I like to take risks. I'm extremely competitive. So I think the role suits me. And I think it's more a question of personality rather than gender. For me, I've been involved in the business now for more than 20 years. And I remember in my very first job, people, men, sort of refer to me as you, the sales chick. <laughs> <laughs> that has not happened in a very long time. I've not heard anybody refer to any person as in, in, in terms like that. So that's 20 years of transformation that will just continue over the next 20 years. I think it's got to do with personal confidence and, um, and opportunity also. I can't say that um, I... I was also very fortunate, and that's I think that's always in life if you if you have a bit of combination of both. Yes. Perhaps I can just jump in there. I think uh, as somebody does research on gender, we we find out all the world over that the wine industry is is rather male dominated, and I think it uh, reflects some of the things that Christiane said, but also heritage lines of, of inheritance as well in, in terms of family businesses which uh, which in some, yes. some cultures tend to run by the by the sons and not by the daughters and the and yes. who goes to agricultural college or the or the technical training but yes. it also linked but maybe the type of jobs that are available and that, that that for men and women in the in the sector and that but also the, the, maybe it's an opportunity to say a little bit more about the type of jobs that are available in the sector generally not just the people who yes. are wine experts because bruce there's an also a question in the in the in the in the chat about the, the where the jobs are available beyond sales and beyond and to 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 yes. what what how would you describe the full range of jobs that are available in the sector? Um, so uh, I'll just want to discover the question. Um, I moved from Durban to Cape Town to work in the wine industry two months ago, only to find out that sales is not for me. How do I continue learning about wine and hopefully get other employment in the wine industry? Yeah, there's plenty of opportunities in wine that are not necessarily at the forefront and customer facing. So there's a lot of administrative work, there's the hospitality side of things, there's logistics, which is something that I find, uh, in my experience, women are particularly good at. <laughs> not sure why but it's that very structured way of thinking planning getting things done logistics for me is probably if you want to work with wine it probably is one of the, the things that i unless you want to make wine um yourself so it's, it's a wonderful field because you get to know the wines themselves you get to know different markets you deal with so many different it's almost yeah you get exposed to the entire world of wine but you don't have to actually sell it. You just fulfill the orders and you deal with the different legislations and the different deadlines and everything. So if you like having juggling things and dealing with wine, I think the logistics and those sort of things are very interesting. Um, I don't know about your it's suggestions. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a diverse value chain. And yeah. as mentioned earlier, in terms of production, it's all the way from a very specialized field of viticulture 
to the winemaking process, to the production, to the packaging, to the design of the packaging, mm -hmm. to the logistics behind it, to international marketing. To, um, and I think in terms of marketing and sales, I think that's also where there has been a, a lot of maturity in the South African wine industry. It used to be one title, the sales and marketing manager. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, those two are now sort of separate. Yeah. And it's an important step to make for an industry. Um, and just going back to your question about learning about wine, I think there are so many opportunities to learn about wine. And I think, um, again, just linking back to COVID, um, with online tasting panel, um, platforms and online learning platforms, I think that world has also opened up in terms of being able to learn about wine. Completely agree. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Zulani. A few years ago, I was introduced to non-alcoholic wine. Is the product still, um, does the product still exist in the market? And if yes, how does it differ from other non-alcoholic beverages? Um, we, we don't produce non-alcoholic wines within the group. We produce lower alcohol, lower alcohol wines in the group, but um, yes, absolutely, the non-alcoholic wine um, sector has absolutely boomed because of COVID in South Africa. And on a technical level, a relatively normal wine is produced, and then they use a centrifuge which takes out the alcohol. So it's it's not doctored grape juice; it is actually wine that is changed into non-alcoholic wine, and. Um, Yes, it absolutely does exist, and it is, it is, it's, it's getting broader and broader um, and more diverse in what it offers. But um, the same also applies to lower alcoholic wines and lower calorie wines and um, more health conscious types of wines. And I think and there's another question here. Sorry. The other, the other question, Ada, was about the movie, just giving us a, a, your opinion, your perspectives on the other wines that people may, may have received in the package. Or you can you just repeat that one? Um, the, to give us your, your, your expert opinions on the other wines that people would have received in the package. Oh, yes, of course. Right. Of course, of course. <laughs> okay, sorry. We started chatting away and started importing what we want to drink. So, not, not, um, that we've all, not that we've already, just to say, not that we've already drunk two bottles of wine, but we're just, uh, we're just keen to hear your opinions. <laughs> okay. All right. So part of the package was also your Sauvignon Blanc, yeah. which we didn't discuss. Um, no, we, we can discuss that now. The Professor Black uh, Sauvignon Blanc is uh, one of the very uh, latest additions to our portfolio, which... Uh, Apart from the wine, goes back to the concept of innovation and continuously coming up with something new that is a point to talk about and to also utilize what we have. So apart from the old vine, Shannon, we also had a very old vineyard of Sauvignon Blanc on the farm, on the new farm that we bought. It's uh, even older than the Shannon. It's from 1975. Beautiful Sauvignon Blanc with lots of gravitas as I like to call it, blended together with grapes from a neighboring vineyard, which is it's, it's a bit younger. Um, so it's grown on the slopes of the Stellenbosch, uh, sorry, <laughs> Simonsburg uh, mountain right behind us here. Um, yeah, it's for me, it's one of my favorite wines in our portfolio. I love the label. Professor Black also just says something about the wine. In fact, Professor Black is also an alumni of the Stellenbosch University. He uh, was active there in the 1960s, it must have been. He um, was developing new um, peach varieties and he used a portion of Warwick to experiment and plant new, new varieties. He was hoping to come to the market earlier than other countries would by developing a pasta or earlier ripening variety, but unfortunately the black southeaster didn't quite work out for him. So the flowers used to just get ripped off before any fruit could develop from those uh, peach trees. So the project was abandoned and rather than peaches, uh, we planted Sauvignon Blanc on that specific site. So hence the name. So there's a nice connection to the University of Stellenbosch and that wine. Um, yeah. 
that's the professor. And let me, while I'm talking about Professor Black, let me quickly also refer to the other one that was in the tasting pack, the Professor Black Pitch Black. It's another addition to our portfolio that we released last year. So COVID has been quite beneficial in the sense that we've just had a lot of time to consolidate our portfolio and uh, make some very good decisions around restructuring uh, the way we presented our wines and added some new ones. And yeah, Professor Black Pitch Black, it's, it's a red blend of six varieties, the five classic Bordeaux varieties that are also well known here in Stellenbosch, plus the uh, Senso, which obviously is a little bit of a nod to uh, regional inspiration from, from elsewhere. And the wine just stylistically, it's, it's got all the uh, elements you'd expect from a classic uh, Bordeaux style, but the Senso element of it is, has not been matured in oak. Um, and that just gives that wine this beautiful lift, that beautiful red freshness, and that speaks to, yeah, a bit of, yeah, combining the old world with a nod and a confident dash of new world winemaking, uh, yeah, bringing in our own ideas into this wine. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it also goes back to history in the 1960s, 70s, when Professor Black would have been around, a lot of the South African wines were actually made from Senso, some of the old Chateau Libertas vintages that everybody would know, had a very generous dash of Senso in them. And if you taste some of those old vintages, they are excellent. So it's, it's combining the old with the new in that one. What did you pull us here? Your Pinotage. Yeah. So um, you have the single block pinotage in that glass. I'm not sure what you have in this glass. Um, so I think quite fittingly, we're going to end off with two pinotages, going back to your discussion on authenticity. So the provenance pinotage, like the provenance Shannon, again, from the estate. And in terms of our style of pinotage, um, We've, we've sort of taken Pinotage and tried to produce a wine that is more delicate, more elegant, and more refined. And Pinotage is a crossing of Cinso and Pinot Noir, but it is unlike either of those two. It's a, it's a totally different grape varietal, and it produces totally different wines. But um, to sort of link to the Pinot Noirish side of it, to produce a more feminine style of the varietal. And um, speaking of future of the wine industry, we've um, also presented several tastings where we collaborate with other wineries to talk about the future of Pinotage in some um, global or virtual media tastings that we've done. And I think if you look at, I mentioned the maturity of the South African wine category. Pinotage as a category used to be pretty monotonous in the sense that a pinotage was likely to be bold, quite heavy, often extracted, high in alcohol, and a big boy wine. And um, it's, it's a great varietal that offers more than that. Again, if you look at the pinotages that were produced in the 70s, they often had an alcohol of 30% alcohol, not 14 and a half, like was often the case 10 years ago. And we're sort of leaning back to, to that with the, with the provenance pinotage. Um, and also, again, speaking of diversity within the um, category, this wine is produced from different vineyards, which include bush vines, includes higher trellised wines, includes wines from northern slopes, includes wines from um, eastern slopes. And with that, you get a wine that focuses on delicate flavors and complexity instead of just being bold and big. I've got a colleague in France called Jean-Pierre Durant, and he often says that um, a wine is supposed to be a kiss, not a rugby tackle. <laughs> and um, we still have many rugby tackles, and they have their place in the industry, the big and bold ones, and they, they tend to do quite well in America. Um, but there is also a place for wines that are more delicate and focus on the complexities, wines that are a kiss, and the provenance is indeed a kiss. It's such a beautiful question. <laughs> yeah. And um, going back to wines of origin, wines that have a story to tell, and wines that are very, very specific in where they come from, the last wine that we're going to taste, David. 
Yeah, it's this one. Is the Lavinia single vintage? It is from a vineyard that is on the highest point of Lavinia. And like in the case of Professor Black um, vineyard, it is influenced by wind um, a lot, especially in the growing season. And Pinotage is an early ripening varietal. So um, when Cabernet is still ripening, it's just after the raison, it's, it's still quite safe in the vineyard. Um, that's when we're actually picking Pinotage. And it is the hottest month in Stellenbosch. So um, it, is a, it is a varietal that has its own way of, 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 of um, viewing it. And I think that is the beauty of where we are with Pinotage. With the, with the specialization that's going on, you have Pinotage specialists that aren't just producing red wine when they produce Pinotage, they're producing a Pinotage and they're producing a site-specific Pinotage. And this is exactly what this reflects. It is a, it is a vineyard that is on top of the hill here at Lavinia. And it is heavily influenced by the wind in the sense that it doesn't grow very rigorously in the vineyard. Um, the, um, the, 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 the grapes are smaller, the berries are smaller, it has never been irrigated. And when you have a vineyard that produces smaller berries, there's a likelihood that you're going to produce a wine that has more concentrated flavors. And this is exactly what you get in this wine. Um, it is to a large extent very minimum interventionist in the sense that it's made in the vineyard. There aren't many tricks in the cellar. Um, it's it's not over extracted like some penetages are, and it also showcases a feminine side of it, even though it is dark and it is sort of brood, or it's almost brooding. It's a very, very um, concentrated wine, um, but it's not a rugby tackle. <laughs> I like that description. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ado, I love your rugby tackle. Uh, is that do you think, do you think there are do you think there are parallels with what you describe in terms of that refinement of the wine with what's happened in Languedoc? Because I know Advini is I think Advini is based near the Languedoc, so they and there that that wine has gone through. Uh, that's the south sort of southern part of France for anybody who's not in France. Uh, it's and it's that wine has gone through a renaissance of of quality and nuance and uh, and improving its image uh, greatly in recent years. Do you, do you think there are parallels? In that between yeah, and I, I think what you just mentioned there, um, so at Vinny Strength is definitely in the south of France. That's where rather their roots are in the south of France. And when they visited Stellenbosch, they saw many similarities between the south of France a couple of years ago and what we have in Stellenbosch now in terms of the opportunity of um, value growth instead of looking at production growth. And um, that's also where sort of differentiation comes in. One of the differ differentiating aspects of Advini was they were a pioneer in terms of biodynamic and organic wine production. That's why we've embarked on this journey here in South Africa as well. And um, the Languedoc area used to be an area that is mostly known for table wines and more and more some very fine wines are coming from that area. And I, I guess exactly the same would apply to South Africa. Thanks. Any other questions? I haven't been keeping an eye on the clock. Um, so I don't know if, if, if we're ready to say goodbye, but- um, Wait, Mark, we're, we're, just... we're so, well, I've, I've got my eye on the clock. I'm enjoying the wine and the conversation, but uh, we've been... <laughs> <laughs> this is the best this is definitely the best way to finish the day for sure is it? <laughs> um uh i think we we've more or less gone through all of the questions and uh, uh just, one question, one? just one question yeah. from wendy i think um so um has there ever been consideration of the usb alumni wine club uh, my local, local wine club has, has gone virtual in the last 18 months and the model has worked so well could be a good marketing tool for you for the, for the business school the link to pro, uh, oh me the link to ask comments about uh, developing closer collaboration with wine farms and neighbours. I think that's uh, that, Wendy. That's a really interesting comment. I think um, th there are many ways which the business school can promote links with the with the wine with the wine lands with the wine wine sector in and around uh, Stellenbosch in the Western Cape. I and what we talked about tourism, uh, Christiane and uh, and, and Ada talked about tourism and. 
it's it's also part of the experience i think of coming to coming to south africa and for not just for tourists but also for students as well we 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 we're hosting a global responsible leadership conference in a few months and with that we hope to host that in where in a in a place where we can benefit from that that experience so anything that connects us more strongly with that ecosystem is a uh, is is really what is really wonderful for us maybe that just leads me to one final question then before I wrap it up is is, is to Edo and Christian is do you do you do you think there are particular ways with which the business school can or, or low-hanging fruit with which we can sort of promote links between uh, business education and what's going on in the uh, in, in or the imperatives and the challenges that are facing the sector Um, let me start by saying that I think that the business school is already playing a significant role in the wine industry. Um, every year in the MBA classes, there are people that are either winemakers or work within the wine industry. And if you look at the eating wine figures in the wine industry, many of them had their time at Stonebosch Business School. And I think it's important to maintain the relationship with people within the wine industry. That is the first step. Um, from a research perspective and through my PhD, I was sort of pulled back into that world. I think there is a bit of a void in terms of research in the wine industry in South Africa. I think there is a huge opportunity. And I think wherever MBA studies, and there are many of them at the USB, can be um, sort of taken to the next level to be published. And um, I, th I think there is an opportunity for that as well. Especially if you follow, um, if you follow wine academia, there is an opportunity to really make an impact from South Africa, and there is an interest in that as well. And um, I think the the USB Wine Club is a fabulous idea, and I think it was probably started tonight. And I hope yeah. that we can yeah. build from this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just want to add to what Ida was saying about how how there can be contributions to the wine industry. And I think it links back to one of the questions that was asked earlier. I think perhaps there isn't even enough understanding of uh, students of the opportunities that are within the wine industry. I think perhaps people think of wine, if they haven't previously been involved in the industry, perhaps they just see winemaking and viticulture as the main elements of wine, but there is so much more behind it. There is there is accounting, there is um, logistics and supply chain management. There are so many, yeah, science, um, and what do you call it, Chemi chemistry, uh, bio biology, all of these fields, all of these disciplines, that's the word that I was looking for earlier, um, have a potential application within the wine industry, which where they would be making a huge contribution and I often feel that all these brilliant graduates actually wander off into other fields possibly because they were never aware that we also need those people in the wine business mm. so I think that's maybe where a bit of um, yeah, exposure from the university side exposing them to the true world of wine making and wine selling could make a great contribution and Mark you mentioned it earlier but I think collaborating with other leading global business schools in wine in, in the wine industry is a very important part of it. And um, there's the Dijon Business School, which is closely linked to Burgundy. Um, there are some very interesting universities in Australia that work closely in the wine industry. The same applies to California. And to you've used the word ecosystem a lot, to become part of the academic ecosystem in terms of wine um, to, a, to a larger degree would be very, very useful to this industry. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's not a nice link back to me just to to wrap up uh, and and really thank uh, firstly Edo and Christian for their e expert uh, tour de force of uh, of South African wines and and uh, and not just the uh, top tips on tasting, drinking, and what we should be accompanied with, but also your careful thoughts and, and considered expertise around. The challenges facing the sector but also the opportunities for the sector and i say the opportunities for for graduates and our and our and our alumni i think that's uh it's very it's it's really it's really exciting i think that can this this combination of uh 
business expertise and the pleasure of drinking wine is uh, is 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 most definitely the the future. <laughs> one, of the, one of the main attractions of working in the industry. <laughs> most 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 definitely. But I, I think I was really I was really interested in how you uh, your the, the points you you made around the how the, the marketing of, of, and the ex, the need to expand the, the consumption of wine and introduce new. Uh, new consumers and and you you rightly pointed out my my certain snobbery around our ice cubes and I think you are exactly right that we should be it should be much more imbre- inclusive the what wine uh, um, the uh, wine wine industry whether that's gender race but also uh, new new drinkers and old and, and old drinkers but also the need for responsible leadership in terms of being res- uh, in terms of sustainability carbon footprint uh, re- reducing waste or uh, becoming more more organic so. I really look forward to this as, or I really see this, sorry, as the, few, the first of many collaborations between us and the business school and the, and, and the wine sector. The first of many events where we think we try to consolidate our links with the, with, within the alumni already. And we probably are underestimated links within the alumni, alumni around uh, in, in, in the wine sector, but then use that as a springboard to develop further opportunities, whether that's the research that Ada recommend, was talking about, or opportunities for academic connections between uh, our partners in other, other parts of the world. We're actually partners with some of those universities, would you believe it, but we don't really do wine with them. It's just that it's a really huge, uh, huge opportunity for us, but also in terms of, uh, in terms of our teaching and, find not, 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 and perhaps most importantly, or is just in, in terms of collaborating and uh, around a, a wine club and, and sharing the pleasure of drinking wine and whether you're going on to, to drink your wine with babotti or curry or sushi uh, a huge thank you for your participation and uh thank you thank and thanks uh looking forward to seeing you again cheers over to christelle cheers 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 just mm-hmm. thank you so much mark for those spot on words and i from my side I would just like to thank you, the panelists, for wonderful discussion um, and pointing us to opportunities and to the key um, global challenges that you also find resonate in the wine industry. I want to thank Wendy. Thank you for this wonderful, um, I see you there, um, for your wonderful proposal. And you noted to me that you'll work on something and we can discuss in the next week. Um, I think we have a good group here to start this discussion and also make those links international, as Marcus just um, said. Um, Thank you for that. I think it is the birth of the USB wine club, (laughs) and we'll take that further. Lastly, I just want to thank Mark for this was his idea originally, that we host this event. And I would really, really like to thank you. You've opened up a new door of opportunity for us to grow, to to explore the research opportunities and to make those closer connections with the wine industry and with our alumni and how we can leverage that for the USB. Thank you so much for that, Mark. Well, that, well, I I should share. I should share. I, it, the idea came about in a in a discussion with Ado, so I should share the response. Share some of the glory, and it wouldn't. <laughs> and it certainly wouldn't happen without Lizelle and Vincent and Christelle uh, doing all the hard work in the background. So thanks. Thanks, everybody. We look forward to this being the first of many, uh, many wine related uh, events. Thank you. Goodbye. Enjoy the wine. (laughs) Have a good evening. Bye. (laughs) Bye.